I, my interest in China was really, a, to be honest, I was a tourist. My, I have a brother who lives out there, and you know, it's like with family, you can spend a little bit of time with them, and then you need to go travelling. So, <laughs> for the last 11 years, I spent a little bit of dog cocking, I'm pleased. I spent a little bit of time with him, then decided to go travelling. And it was really, it was, it was about, it's 2000, and we've been doing it for about 11 years, and my partner made the last contribution. I was a bit worried he might take what I was going to say about combined and even development, which of course he did. Um, but it was, it was being in Shenzhen, which, you know, for people who haven't been to, to that particular bit of China, the Lonely Planet, Love the Lonely Planet. Says it's a fishing with a fishing village in 1980 with a population of about 30,000. Yeah. And you're sitting there going, Where the fuck have all these people come from? <laughs> and actually, it's because my daughter now 17, so she was 12 at the time, and uh, some, some 12 year old girls are, she was into Claire's accessories. Well, if you go to Shenzhen, it's a bit like a mass Claire's accessories. I mean, it's Claire's accessories on from here to King's Cross. You know, it is that level. So, of course, she was in her element. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, this place is very young. People keep standing up to give my partner a seat, you know, because he's older than they are. <laughs> and it, it, it then occurred to me, actually, what, obviously, what it was going on was the migrant workers, and particularly women, young women, which is where the players' accessories came from. And then I began to think, hang on a minute, they're young women now, but at some stage, some of them, or many of them, will want to have families. And what happens then? And when we talk about the first and second generation, it, you know, people, it was mentioned a bit this morning, and I think it's important, because actually for the first, and that's not to generalise too much, but for the first generation, particularly of women, they went back home, they, you know, they took the, the money that they, they created, got created, yeah, with them, and they you know, settled back at home. But for the second generation of women, and now we've been to the rural areas, and despite the horrors of the dormitories that, that Jenny explained, etc., actually the idea of going back to something which is, you know, this sh literally shitting in a bucket type stuff, isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to be there. And then what happens when they have kids? And I started reading actually um, this, well, this great book, uh, Factory Girls. And I'm going, you know, when you start saying yeah, that actually at some stage there is going to have to be a collective solution. We've seen the horrors of the people throwing themselves off the roof of Fox Tom, but at some point there is going to have to be a collective solution to this. And that's where, where I started, you know, getting interested. And then the following year, it's like a tip, like a travel log, we were in Chengdu and I was in a youth hostel. And I'm saying, I'm, I was talking to somebody, I don't know why you ended up, I think I'm probably reading the book with me. And I was talking to this guy from, I think he's from Sweden or Denmark, and I was saying, at some point there has to be a collective solution, particularly if, you know, the women who are now working in the factories want to have children because you can't have children in the dormitories. You know, you just, it just can't happen. And he said, it's funny you should say that. <laughs> he said, well, my mother, you know, it's a bizarre conversation. You know. My mother, oh, is a, is a, is a businesswoman in Den Denmark or Sweden. And she said, and she's, they've got a, a, a shop, a factory in, I think it was Shanghai, which makes gloves. I said, very interesting. He said, well, one day they got a phone call to say, they're not working. What do you mean they're not working? The one manager said, what are they? No, the workers, they've come into work. They've got there, and they, but they're not working. They will not work. We cannot make them work. And they were sitting there with their arms folded. So the, 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 the owner, the glove maker, said, well, look, get the union in. I, you know, get, the union, get the union. We'll find out what they want. Give them what they want. So they'll go back to work. And she <laughs> said, there is no union. OK, well, go down to the shop floor and ask them to elect some people to represent them, to tell them what the, to tell, tell us what they want, so that we can give it to them, so they can go back to work, because we need the bloody gloves. <laughs> now, for me, as a revolution Marxist, I'm thinking, whoa, you know, I know there's balloting and all that, <laughs> waiting 40 years to go, no, girls don't start there. But that was, that was, that was, that was a th the thing for me, and I thought, you know, this is actually quite interesting, and it was particularly the, the side of the gender that I was particularly interested in, lecture and other people do the economics bit. And it was this idea of what happens when, and that's how I got interested, and then, of course, you start looking at Hong Kong, and, you, and I have to admit, very rarely I'm right, but this particular book, I am, was right. I said, it's going to blow up in Hong Kong. My mark, the retail didn't mark them. I said, something is going to happen in Hong Kong in, in September. And of course, mm -hmm. I mean, much bigger than I thought it was going to be, but it was there. And the reason was, partly because I'm a teacher, and I knew about the, you know, we've had girls with the British values curriculum we're supposed to be teaching, etc. But actually, within Hong Kong, there'd been a similar sort of idea of Chinese values being taught in schools, and there'd been massive demonstrations against it two years ago. And I'm kind of thinking, we could do with a few massive demonstrations against Gove and, and, and Nicky Morgan, etc., etc., you know, so I like this idea. But the, the point about it is they've won. 
they won, they'd stop, you know, it became voluntary as opposed to compulsory. And this was, you know, and the thing was building up, so I knew it was going to happen. I also knew for another, I don't know about it because I'm not an academic, although I've now got my main Chinese business studies because I couldn't speak the language to the Chinese studies course. But, but one of the things that we, I do is we look at what, is, what words are banned at the moment because, you know, it's really useful. If you, if, you, if you think there's something going on in a city or a town or whatever, chances are the words will be banned. So you, therefore you look for the banned words and you can work out what's going on. Try and work out what's going on. Interesting, this is, this, is a, uh, this is a site that's it's actually based in Hong Kong, which looks at the banned words and how many words are banned. The data, the amount of entry into that, for 2014 uh, uh, is missing. It's gone. <laughs> Gremlins have got it due to technical problems. <laughs> oh, I wonder what they are. Well, luckily, I managed to save the thing from The Economist from, from last year. And these are the banned words. Now look at what happens. June the 4th. Chinaman Square, peak of banned words, and Charlie can talk about rubber ducks because I did one, but he's here, so I can't. You know, sat with rubber ducks was banned at one stage because it's anyway, that's another story for the pub. The July the first protest in Hong Kong, even higher than Chinaman Square, and then of course it goes off the scale when it comes to comes to September and Occupy Central. They went. I mean, this is this is a picture from the. July the 1st in Hong Kong. This picture was banned, obviously, <laughs> banned in, in China. But as a colleague said earlier, you know, my, my 16, 17 year old, when she goes to China, manages to communicate with her friends back home. I think the Chinese youngsters are probably even more sophisticated than my 17 year old, don't quote me on that. Um, and, therefore, and therefore find a way through. It's been mentioned before, but it's worth, it's worth just going through the figures. Internal security. No, sorry, let's, go, let's do it because we talked about um, the sort of political aspects of, of uh, China this morning. 106 billion pounds is spent on defence. 106 billion. Yeah. Sorry, dollars, not pounds, dollars. 111 billion dollars is spent on internal security. That meant since 2011, actually, internal security outweighs uh, a defence, is bigger than defence. So they're more frightened of their own people than they are of the foreign devils. And, that, and, and that's okay. And it's, it's not, I mean, there's two, I think it's at least two million people whose job is to do this, banning words, quick, ban it, ban it. You know, I, I mean, I, 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 and that is there. In fact, I was, uh, was going to put it back, I think it would take too much time. There is actually a song on YouTube, which is, it's the, it's the people who ban the words. They have a song, which I'll put on Facebook or something for you later. And it's, oh, you know, we are for the glorious, wonderful China, etc., etc. But it's not just about, about the internet. It's interesting, over the last, what we've seen over the last few ten years, is the police and the army, you, fair, you don't see as much of them anymore. You know, on, on the streets, of, uh, with the exception of two places. One is Zhejiang province and the other one is Tibet. But, I mean, if anybody wants, you know, the, the book people should read, if, you, if you've got a birthday coming up, this is the one I recommend, mm -hmm. The People's Republic of Amnesia. It came out last year absolutely brilliant in terms of what we have to remember at Chenaman Square and how important that event is and how important it is for us to talk about it over here in the West. But there's one of the Chenaman mothers who, where her son was found after the massacre, okay, there is a CCTV camera actually on that side so she's so she's unable to, um, to lay flowers or candles or anything like that. So, and she says, she's a lovely. Such a great, and you've got magic, she's a little old lady now, okay? And I like this idea, the little old lady bit. Such a great, glorious, crack party is afraid of a little old lady. It shows how powerful we are, this little group of old people, because we represent righteousness. They represent evil. So they're afraid of us, and we're not afraid of them. Now, I like that little idea of a little old lady saying things like that, you know. Also, I mean, again, you know, to go without take up too much time. In Chengdu there was also a huge demonstration, etc. After, I mean that even after after the sixth of, of, uh, of June. But what happened is that also got massacred. And there's a, there's a little, another little old lady who is is, is followed, particularly around Chenman Square anniversary, by twenty uh, twenty. 20 secret, secret police. And she said, I know where they are. I can see them. They're just roads. And they follow her to the market. And they follow her here. And they follow her. You know, they follow her. And that's, you know, when, when, when um, Tim talked about them being clever, I'm not sure that that's clever. I think they're quite scared. Let's just go back. Right. 
And they're scared. You see, when we think talk about Hong Kong, and when we're always talking about Hong Kong, we talk about oh, sorry, Vince, we talk about um, the, the Hong Kong people remembering Tiananmen Square, and that's why you know their anniversary march is so important because they're the memory. Yeah. Mm. But actually, the fact that in China itself people don't talk about it is also because <laughs> in some senses they haven't learned the lesson because they don't know the, they don't know the history. Probably could we'll come out. Right. Where are we? Okay. There's a couple of things, and I've only got 10 minutes to speak. I know it's, the pub is open and you're all getting very tired. We've all been very good all day. There's just one, one last thing, <laughs> thing about, um, about the, the madness of censorship. Now it's going to this one. On 2012, the stock exchange, in, uh, stock exchange equivalent in Shanghai fell by 64.89. It was banned because, of course, that's the representative of China was square in 89. So when all these businessmen went to log in to find out their stocks and shares were going, they found a, a notice saying, you know, this cannot be so, this is controversial, etc., etc. So that's quite a nice story. Um, there's a couple of other things really to talk about in terms of, in terms of the effect of Hong Kong. See, I, that's just, we talked about the strikes figures um, this morning, and that's quite. I mean, I think it's quite important to see that initially strikes tended to be concentrated here, but they're now moving moving west. You know, when Foxconn moved its factory, when I mean, Jay talked about you know, I talked about the horrors of Foxconn. But actually, PC World of all places, PC World had an article in, in October last year which talked about a thousand workers walking out of Foxconn and the problems that would have in terms of, of producing. Um, I don't think it, I don't think it was either. It was one of the other. It wasn't the iPhone? It was one of the other Sony or something. Okay. So they, you know, they, they, they are trying to sort of move the factories away from the strikes, but not being quite successful. I notice there's at least one teacher in the audience who's not at the three education conferences that are happening today. Just be wrong. What we've seen over the last year is something. Is, it, is, a, is, is again these are the number of teachers' strikes. I mean, at the beginning, at the end of the year, and it's very cold up here. I mean, you're talking really cold. But there was a, a strike of teachers, of 4,000 teachers who, 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 who were striking. You were actually striking, interestingly enough, because the, the government started deducting from their pensions and they're very, very, very badly pay, paid in, in, in China. So uh, these are the number of strikes. It's not huge, but it's slightly significant, particularly if you're an active member of the NUT. Okay. The other thing about education, and I, again, there are other things like the, the, the um, movements against various pollutions, you know, I mean, Chengdu two years ago, there was going to, 18 months ago, there was going to be a massive march, and everyone was talking about it, against the, against the plants that they were going to build 18 miles away. They were, everyone was talking about it, well, the journalists, the, actually, it was this woman again, she said that, you know, she got off the, off the, um, the taxi and they were all talking about it. The Chinese state, now you'll like this one, moved the weekend. This is 18 months ago. It hasn't been publicised, but they moved. So instead of only the weekend on Saturday and Sunday, <coughs> they actually moved it to Monday and Tuesday. I mean, I mean, this is this is sort of 1984 type stuff, isn't it? But you think actually, why did they move? Why did they make the drastic of moving the weekend? Remember, we should move the weekend to this weekend. That was on Monday and Tuesday, etc. But that, I mean, that's that, and there have been a number of, of disputes on pollution, etc., etc. But we haven't got time, time to, to go into it. If anybody. This is actually online. This is produced by a group called Globalisation Monitoring, who are based in Hong Kong, and you can get it online. But it's it's it's, it's from 2004. It's about a battle the workers had against um, being poisoned by the work, by work, basically. But it's worth a, a read because it goes to what a lot of workers have to do in Hong in China in terms of, of mobilising, taking action. But the real one for me is education. And I'm going to spend a little bit, just a little bit of time, talking about it. because when I talk about what happens to the next generation. You'll have heard the, the expression left behind, you know, the children who are left behind, left behind in the villages by, and looked after by grandparents or friends or, or the members of the families, etc. And there's 61 million of them. I mean, there's a staggering number of children left behind. But you're also getting a time now where the children are moving to the cities with their parents. Now, what happens within China is that, as it was said earlier on by you and she got Jane, is that you do not have the right to education. So if you're a city, you've got, if you've got a city hukou, you know, your parents are a city, you can go to Shanghai schools and you'll see how we've got maths, maths teachers coming across to Britain to teach how to teach maths, etc. But if you're a migrant child, you can't do that. You have three choices. 
Your first choice is to, to, for your parents to pay for you to go into to the state school, but you also have to provide five documents, and they look for all sorts of different ways of excluding you from the school. And once you're in the school, if you manage to get into the school, actually, they're treated a bit like the Gypsy Roman Chinese children are treated in Britain, you know, called smelly, da -da 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 -da. and it takes a huge amount of, of, of the family income just to send them to school. Or you can go to a migrant school. These are, I was going to say the equivalent of free school, but you know, the migrant schools are the poorer schools. They have, um, they, they have, very, um, have a very precarious existence. In fact, in 19, ooh, 19, 2014, I think, well, no, 2013, um, in Beijing, they closed down 24 schools over the summer. Okay? These are 24, affecting 14,000 children. The reason the Chinese, the Beijing government said, gives a look and said they were closing down, was for health and safety reasons. If any of you have ever been to China and seen a construction site, or, or the images that, that Jenny showed earlier on, health and safety is not the issue, you know. And, uh, and I mean, it, and, and it, you know, left for, as I say, 14,000 children, though. they are not a perfect ideal solution. In fact, they're, they're the poorest solution. Or you don't go to school at all. Well, well, they're good. You get to 14, 15. Even if you've lived in the city all your life, in order for you to go to high school, you have to go back to the province where your parents came from. And the way that the curriculum's worked in China is it's a localised curriculum. So you can imagine, you know, they, now when, when Tim, he's gone now, but when Tim said about, you know, families can be conservative things, families can be but families also can be, can be mobilising things as well. And the beginning, it's not huge. I mean, don't, don't, you know, don't go away. It's like Inkay says. It's not huge, but you're beginning to see small protests of parents who are saying, we want our children to have an education. Because in some senses, you know, you'll put up with the rubbish in order for your kids to have a better life. That's, you know, that's, that's a long way shorter. If your kids aren't going to have a better life, actually you are going to begin to find, not just, just the economic reasons, but also that those, those reasons of social security, of education. So I think it is going to become an issue. I mean, the place called Shaoxing, which is a, a just, I know this is the city, where uh, the image has now gone off the internet. <coughs> But there was an image, there was a, there was a, recently there was a, a protest of migrant fathers and mothers who were trying to get their kids, they, they suddenly discovered their kids couldn't get into school. So they were, they were protesting outside the local government. They may try and find a way of solving it. You know, they may go for a mass education expansion, etc. But of course, there is the divide of, of, of the city dwellers going, oh, we don't want our children, we don't want our children educated, these children. So there is that contradiction going on. Uh, just, just very briefly as well. I think, I think it is worth saying. It hasn't been hasn't been said yet. The province, this province, oh yeah, okay, right, where you know we talk about Islamophobia in the West, but actually there is Islamophobia going on over there as well. You know, so it doesn't always going to go on the up. It, 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 it goes each way. And the Chinese government, of course, are trying to use um, the repression of the Ouija's to in order to justify that all the words that are used in Britain in terms of the prevent the gender is are being in use, in use in China as well. To the extent of you know fasting bans for for, for 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 youngsters during Ramadan, you know, you've got the whole thing about kids being teachers being forced to feed children in order to break the fasting. In a number of cities, they haven't just banned the veil, the niqab, the burqa, but they've said to people if you go on a if you if you, if you, you will not be allowed on the bus if you've got a big beard. So that sort of idea and all the words that are being used in Britain are being used by the Chinese ruling class as well. So it's not all it's not all roses in the garden. Okay. I have got how long left? There's my teachers, uh, my very cold teachers in Harvard, not mine, but okay. She's got that. got two minutes. Right. There's a couple of things to say. I did sorry, this is this is this is for people this is Kashka and this is basically the clearance out. Of the, of, the, of the old community. So you've got, you know, the red bits demolished. And the, I mean, if anybody's been to Kashka, the stunningly beautiful old town is now being completely, apart from, of course, the green bits, they're for the tourists, because you can't forget about the tourists. But we haven't got time to, to go into that. I think the importance, I mean, Lauren's talked about Hong Kong. I don't know about anybody else in the room, but I must admit I had to change my sleeping patterns during that period of time. And I do have a, an aversion to an umbrella, right? I did. You know, being a short person, there is a material basis for this. I hated umbrellas. And the reason I hated umbrellas is because if you're short, you're going to hurt somebody. 
and if somebody carries one over you, it's patronising. My poor partner only found this out recently. Was, Why do you always want to get it? I like to get my hair wet. No, it's because I hate people holding umbrellas. But of course, the umbrella became symbolic with, with, with the Hong Kong movement. And, it, and, it, and I think it is important, you know, like that, you know, the whole, I mean, I love the from Gaza to Hong Kong, you know, that sort of idea of the internationals. We, we watched Chelyman Square at Chelyman Square in 89 on the BBC. Now we can watch, we could watch it lifetime. And I think one of the reasons I was asked to, to, to do this, or to do this session was when I watched the tear gassing on the, the, the Sunday night, you know, I'd seen, I'd seen the pepper spray, etc. And I thought, we have to do something. What can we do? What can we do? And we put together a, we put together a letter which we got circulated around people like the, the leadership of the NUT, Christine Blower, Kevin Cohen, condemning the actions of the Hong Kong police, you know, calling for democracy, etc. Now, it, it may have seemed, seemed like a little thing at the time, but actually it's quite important in terms of that way you, you can build international solidarity at a small level, if you like, but it becomes quite key in terms of it being announced in, in Hong Kong. So, there are just one last thing to say before I finish. So, that's a little poster up here. I mean, when people talk about, oh, he's a revolutionary, what did These are the people who were arrested in China, or some of the people who were arrested in China for showing, for just showing simple signs. What's happened to them? Maybe you know, maybe Vincent can talk about. But I think it's incredibly brave what those people do. And I'm not surprised, you see, why the left would tend to concentrate on NGOs, because actually it is, it is safer. The organisation that I mentioned before, they are allowed to go into China as long as they're reporting on multinationals, not on, on the state. Where does it leave us now, apart from going to pub? It leaves us now with, I think, a sense of responsibility as the left in, uh, the left in Britain or, or, or in, in the West, because we have to tell the story of China, and we have to tell about how you know, amazing the struggle was and how it was massive, because people in China aren't, aren't, aren't hearing it. When I've done a few meetings around the university, it's interesting that you get people from mainland China. They don't say anything. Hong Kong shoes like that. That's what. But afterwards, you know, you, 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 there was one guy I remember, he was an older, older person, and um, when I talked about Chinaman Square, his eyes lit up. When I went to speak to him afterwards, I said, where are you from? And he said, I'm visiting a professor um, from Beijing. And that was enough, because I thought, I get there, I work there. Work, 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 you know. So we have a responsibility, we have a responsibility to, you know, when events like this happen, to try and show as much international solidarity as we can. And also, to be honest, we've got to remember Trotsky. You know, the Chinese, the, you know, the Chinese work, work movement has been around a long time. You know, you read about 25 and 27, etc. We have to, we have to resurrect that as well. You know, we have to try and get as many people as we can talking about the history of China because people in China don't necessarily know their own history. So we have to learn it in order to, to, to teach it to them too. I'm going to respond to your final comments there because you can talk about kind of portraying a particular vision of history and the problem is that I guess a kind of Chinese agency can be denied and like political contestation can be denied if we're kind of reproducing I guess some kind of quite broad sweeping narratives about events like 89 and what's happened in Hong Kong. Like my own research my PhD has been on 89 and the big thing that really came out um, is the kind of class contestation within the protest movement itself, the way that workers were excluded by students. Um, so this is, um, it would be interesting to hear whether that was the case in, in, in the recent protests in Hong Kong as well. Um, and also, kind of, the, the Cultural Revolution has been touched on at times today. I think what we're really seeing is, um, and I guess it's a very pr provocative point, whether, um, in a sense, the utility of Maoism is, st is coming out here in a lot of ways. So kind of grassroots, local resistance, workers' resistance, kind of spontaneous movements. Is this a repetition of the class politics of the Cultural Revolution? Um, but it would be interesting to know as well, in terms of, the, the, the radical left in China, whether they're kind of drawing on those, I guess, pre-existing ideological resources. How, how, the, how is the conflict being framed today? Jenny, and then Alex. Yes. Uh, I too want to thank um, thank Vincent and Sally for two two fascinating present presentations. Um, I want to insist, uh, and, and um, I think it was particularly valuable that Sally used lots of comparisons from Britain and other places, um, because I think it's necessary to insist that we, we need to approach what's happening in China in part from a historical and comparative perspective, because there's a tremendous temptation, because China is so big, 
and so new as an industrial power that we think, oh, history is starting anew here. But, you know, the anecdote that Sally told about the, the Danish capitalist whose Chinese workers go on strike and then they ask them to elect representatives. That reminds me of what happened in Durban in South Africa in 1973 when the, um, uh, the, uh, the black workers' movement, the modern black workers' movement in South Africa started and the union organisation was banned for black, the but the employers needed someone to negotiate with so they demanded that the workers elect representatives. The workers actually refused to elect representatives because they knew they would be picked off and arrested once the strikes, strikes were settled. So it, I think it's extremely helpful to adopt a, a comparative fra framework. And from that, and one of the helpful things of that perspective is that it tells us that in all probability, the struggle won't remain at the local level, but they will develop broader, broader movements. Frankly, talking about the repressive power of the Chinese state, I mean, it's very, very important, and of course it's a very pressing reality for any activist in, in China, but it doesn't, repressive power alone doesn't stop big movements. That, you know, if we look, say it South Africa, say it Brazil, say it Egypt, we see how, despite very brutal repre repression, broad, class-wide, na nationwide movements develop. But there's one other point I want to make, that if we look at that process, what happens at the level of the regime is very important. And I think, I mean, I think it's been a fascinating day, but one aspect that, that hasn't been probed enough, it's come up in questions, is the nature of the regime itself how the Communist Party functions, the internal factional struggles, the relationships to different sectors of capital. This is very important. No, we haven't mentioned the anti-corruption campaign at the present, present time. The guy who was in charge of the security apparatus is now under arrest because he's been purged as part of this present process. A billionaire close to him has been executed. Actually... You know, it's quite a good precedent. <laughs> One billionaire can be ex executed, others can, 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 can be as well. This is a symptom of divisions inside the ruling class. If we look at historical experience, when real political crises develop is when you have a combination of very powerful and generalizing impulses from below with divisions and crisis in the, in the state itself. And time scales are always very different. Difficult. Sooner or later, though, this will happen in China. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just wonder if um, either speaker could talk more about the role of um, environmental issues in um, movements in mainland China and perhaps Hong Kong. You both mentioned it a bit, but I think, you know, as someone that's been involved a little bit in campaigning against climate change in Britain, we still get that argument about oh, it doesn't matter what we do in Britain because of the growth of China and the amount of um, coal-fired power stations they're, um, they're building. Um, and I know that it's causing health problems as well um, in China, particularly in cities, and the client talks about it in the book. So I just wonder, like, is there a, sort of a, a movement for renewable energy or what do you think? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, on that. Um, so, um, Vincent mentioned about the absence of working class in the umbrella movement, and I'm just wondering whether it is a matter of uh, it is a matter of degree in terms of how much they involve. I mean, working class involved in the movement. So, for example, for, for example, I, I and honestly, I didn't, I, I didn't, I, I, I wasn't in Hong Kong either. So, mm -hmm. I, so my understanding was the to, towards the umbrella movement is also from uh, social media and stuff like that. But the problem, but but, but uh, my observation is, although they, uh, they, although there were not massive strikes <laughs> during the during the movement, uh, it doesn't really ne it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, working class is not involved. Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, the new social movement groups as categorized oh, in Vincent's mm -hmm. presentation uh, very largely it, um, it includes um, trade unions as well and mm -hmm. labor groups as well mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also and, and also the presence of working of working class people in um, so like democratic movement in Hong Kong has been unprecedented as I've observed 
and um, and or uh, and for, um, uh, so there wasn't so there wasn't ma there weren't massive strikes during the movement. There was, but there was uh, a, stri a, a strike by social workers and uh, uh, and teachers after mm -hmm. the student uh, after the student announced uh, uh, the strike on campus, and then uh, and then. Um, like uh, workers who students use, who, who students supported in their struggle up before the dem before the umbrella movement also spoke uh, also spoke publicly in support of the work uh, in support of the students during the movement. So um, I think there are, I think there might be a lot of constraints for workers to be completely in, to to be co uh, to completely engage in. The movement. I mean, in comparison to students, due to a lot of cons I do do a lot of concerns in terms of work. But um, I don't. I, I don't think working class is. I I I, I, I don't think working class a, a absence is such a big problem as described mm -hmm. in the presentation. And uh, there was a, there is one more point that I would like to make is that. Is that uh, the mobilization capacity of students, uh, of students and social movement groups, as demonstrated in the umbrella movement, is I think it is largely uh, sort of like um, uh, accumulated from it, uh, it accumulated from uh, previous campaigns, which involves uh, it, which uh, which connects students with working class people, like the Docker strike, in which the work in which students were uh, students were uh, were big supporters of dock workers. And also um, campaigns against um, uh, development projects in the in the rural areas in Hong Kong. So it's like um, through uh, it's like um, through the previous through the through the previous campaigns in movement, students start to uh, re realize that they're sort of like working class nature. And even if they are still students, they're pro probably from uh, they're probably sort of like uh, they're probably still considered social elites. Uh, uh, just because they go to university, mm -hmm. they are workers to be, and they will become. But they, they will become a working. Uh, they will become working people after they graduate. I mean, in later stages of their lives. So I think uh, I think it's the, the series of incidents where, stu where students, I mean, young pe uh, students or young people, start to realize their roots in. Uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, the sort of like determined nature of getting into wage labor, and also to. Try to appreciate that, or appreciate the value of work. Hmm. Okay. Well, Steve, and then Charlie. Uh, yeah, I just want to talk briefly about uh, the importance of raising history. Um, Prince William, I don't know if people noticed this. Prince William spoke a bit of Mandarin during the Spring Festival uh, because he's going over there as part of a, a cultural and business exchange, and he said something like. The UK and China have much to celebrate about our cultural relationship. Well, that's an interesting phrase because was he referring to the 1860 looting of the Summer Palace by Lord Elgin, where they stole huge chunks, or was it the 1900 Anglo-French expedition which burnt most of the cultural heritage <laughs> right around China? If, if you go to loads of visiting places, you see these little plaques. This has been recreated since the Anglo-French expedition of 1900. Basically, most of the rich people who've got big stately homes, when you go around, you see all these sort of Chinese vases, that's where they've come from. And sooner or later, hopefully, the Chinese people will demand some of their cultural heritage back. And it would be certainly a useful thing to mention that Prince, Char uh, sorry, Prince William and his family have probably got most of the gear. Um, so I think it'd be worth pointing that out. And I do think, you know, one of the protest reasons for the protests in Hong Kong was a high price of uh, housing. And you just think, well, you, you know, there are real parallels between what happens in London in terms of house house prices and who's buying it. It's the super rich. Russian, Chinese and British buying up housing in London that are buying up housing in Hong Kong. So there's all these sort of uh, parallels going on and I think it's our duty to raise uh, you know, these points of hypocrisy that our rulers bring about. It's okay, Charlie, and then come with him. <clears throat> of course, what he could have been referring to was the fact that the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank was founded on the proceeds <laughs> of selling opium to opium, opium yes. into China at gunpoint. <laughs> Um, I, I wouldn't agree with the comment over there who talked about 
working working class working class participation in Occupy. Right? I wasn't there, but reading through the interviews in South China Morning Post, in Wall Street Journal, in the other paper, you know, you've got time and time again all the workers who were interviewed who were taking part. What I think was lacking was organised working class participation in the protest. The Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions at one point called uh, called for called for called for general strike in support of Occupy. And as far as I know, one Coca Cola plant came out, and that was the extent. Not more than thirty percent. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but, but, the reality, but the reality was, if you think about a tactic like Occupy, it's actually something that is quite difficult to. Um, engage working class people with around the clock, precisely because they go to exactly the same was true of Tiananmen Square up to before the declaration of martial law. Workers would come to Tiananmen Square, demonstrate their support for the students, but then go back, but then go back to work once martial law was declared. Things then sort of you know very very rapidly fell apart, and for a lot of time, you know, workers were able to. Go to, the, go, to the, go to the square permanently, but there were those, <coughs> but, there were, but, there were the, but there were, but there were those radical divisions. I think Tiananmen Square remains important because, it, and you know, we're saying, of course, that it's it's doubly, <coughs> it's a doubly misleading term. First, because the worst of repression didn't happen in Tiananmen Square. <laughs> Secondly, because it was a national movement. It wasn't just. It wasn't just. It remains important because the Chinese, because the Chinese, because the Chinese rule, because the Chinese. It remains important because people remember it, and I think when Alex talked about you know the rise of powerful and generalising issues, I think it's you know there, there are a number of things that constrain against that. One of them is the memory of Tiananmen Square. We did that. We all rose up as one. They killed. They killed. And it's interesting. In <clears throat> if you look at the documentary about um, the occupation of the village of Wukan. Um, two years ago, two year, they were talking about Tiananmen. They talked about Tiananmen Square. We remember what happened in Tiananmen Square. We can, we can only go. We can only go so far. That's mm -hmm. one. Thing. But the other thing I think it's important to remember is the the articulation of power inside the system has meant that for most people, immediate when they go up against the system, actually they don't go up against Beijing. They go up against the local village committee. They go up against the authorities in that mm -hmm. town. And actually, if they can fight them, if they can get something out of them, that is, on the one hand, that's a process that ensures that there will be more battles, more struggles, more fights. It, it, but it's also something that removes, this, removes the idea of an anti-systemic struggle. You don't have to take on the central state because you can take on the local state and win. And that's, and this is just finished, that's what's so important about Occupy Central, and it's also a question to Vincent as to why this was never mentioned. It's also what was so important about the Sunflower Movement in, in Taiwan, which again we haven't talked about, because those were movements which directed themselves against the central Chinese state. And it seems to me that when we talk about how we can learn from Occupy Central, from Sunflower, about what happens, what happens in China, one of the key things is that they identified the real enemy. Second so, okay, point here and then Amy. Okay. There, there was um, a bit of a disagreement at the end of the last session about how frightened the Chinese ruling class is of the strikes and protests. And um, I just wanted to to come back to that a bit because I think Steve might have been exaggerating a bit, but I think they really are concerned. And one one of the one of the um, consequences of that is that they actually that they, they don't use they use repressive less, uh, measures less than you might think in dealing with protests and strikes. The strategy has been more to try and sort of accommodate them, occasionally pick off uh, so-called ringleaders and so on, but to try and deal with them, keep them confined within one enterprise or one locality, and with the fear that you know more repressive measures are likely to spread it. So they've come down a bit heavier in rural areas where there's less fear of, of sort of contagion, if you like, than they have in in, in, in urban areas. And I think. You know the, that that strategy. I mean, Tim was suggesting at the end of his session that um, that, that they've been successful in, in, in coming down. And I think that, that that's only partially true. You know, they're obviously they're still in power. They've had success at some level, but they've been. Uh, it seems to me. I mean, it, from the evidence that we have, and it's difficult to tell, but it, it does seem that the number of strikes and protests is increasing. So they haven't been successful in channeling them into other areas. That there've been more. Um, waves of strikes within a particular industry or within a particular area, which are, again is something that they've, they've, they've tried to work against. There have now been several cases where workers have successfully uh, 
established elections for union officials in, the, in, in, the, in their workplaces and even occasionally calls for, for independent unions, which obviously haven't got very far yet so far. So I think, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just kind of holding the line in that respect. And I think that's where the, the kind of divisions that Alex talked about in the ruling class come in, because the Chinese ruling class has been more unified over the last 30 years than it was over the previous 30 years. And it was in the, the periods in the previous 30, 30 years where there were disputes at the top that you did get strikes and protests. I mean, they were rare, but those were the occasions. So I think, you know, if, if those kind of divisions are emerging again because of the problems with the economy and, and so on, then that opens up more possibility of the development sort of um, mass movement we've been talking about, which I think it's not just about trade unions or independent trade unions, but that will be an inevitable part of it. And it, again, if you continue the analogy with South Africa, once the South, uh, South African workers were able to establish, the, you know, they were, the government was forced to recognise the South African unions, really its days were numbered, and a few years later we saw the end of apartheid. And I think, you know, that's a process which we can see some sort of parallel with in China. If, if they're able to establish those kind of organisations, then it will be difficult for the, the Communist Party to, to hold on, on to power. But to continue again the analysis, the analogy with South Africa, you know, we look where the South African trade unions are now, um, you know, there has to be more, it's, it's not just about trade unions, we have to go beyond that, I and mean, it's, it's also about introducing socialist politics, and again, I think that's only really possible once we get a, a much uh, bigger movement than we've seen so far. Okay, Amy, and then... There's three things I wanted to bring up that are not really connected to each other that much. One, I suppose, is a question about whether the different sort of groups that you identify in the umbrella movement, to what extent has there been sort of, <coughs> have they influenced one another? Do you see that the new social movement um, has sort of helped, I suppose, bring some of the students more towards the left and things like that? Um, has that? Has that happened? Second question, I suppose, is about Tibet and Xinjiang. And I suppose whether any of the movements that take, any of the movements that strikes or anything, anything else is happening in other bits of China, are they taking up any of those issues around Islamophobia or, or sort of repression in those regions? And to what extent can that be a could that be a, a thing that could be gen, could, could, I suppose is there a movement there that could be generalised? And I suppose if not, what are the of that? Then sort of finally, a sort of question around. So some stuff that Sally talked about at the very beginning of her, her talk, so I thought was quite interesting, around the questions of, okay, what, what happens when, around, I suppose questions around social reproduction, to put it in a, a general sense, because I think, like, how we both think about social reproduction, I think China provides quite an interesting example of, like, migrant, migrant work, like, migrant labour to come in as a way of reproducing the labour force there, and then I suppose different forms of where, you, where labour workers are reproduced in sort of dormitory accommodation and things like that. But then I suppose there's a question around, the question I specifically is around if children of migrants aren't going to be able to go to schools, what is then happening around educating the workforce to then be able to become workers in the future? And like, if, if there's now a labour shortage in China, is this going to exacerbate a problem that's already <coughs> happening there? If, if you're not, and, and will it will it either mean that capital has to sort of say, okay, I suppose that's some sort of about a relaxing the labour system, is that a result of actually needing needing labour to be able to develop and to, to continue to develop? Uh, yeah, it's just a, a couple of questions for Vincent really about the relationship between the process in Hong Kong and the class the class question, because uh, I agree with the woman over there. I mean the. It's very clear, even if you look at the label of lower middle class, that probably includes quite a lot of working class people who simply define themselves in that way. You always have to be careful with these kind of surveys of social movements. And clearly, the, many of the students will go on to become workers. But it's slightly different to having an organic movement of workers that connects to a, to a struggle and utilises the collective strength of workers. My understanding from what I've read is that the teachers, the social workers, and I think the transport workers did call strikes in solidarity with the protests, uh, the umbrella protests. But one of the things I've, I've read suggests that actually the turnout of workers on their strikes was quite limited. And secondly, that the main union federation took a pro-Chinese position and effectively opposed the Occupy movement. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that split in the, in the union movement in Hong Kong and the, its impact on trying to mobilize workers around the, these demands. Secondly, uh, 
the middle session today talks a lot about labour struggles in China. I, I wonder to what extent the movement in Hong Kong identifies with those labour struggles. It seems to me that there were people in China who expressed their solidarity with the movement. When they were arrested by the Chinese state, there wasn't much in terms of trying to build a solidarity struggle with those kind of people. So to what extent do people in Hong Kong identify those struggles as part of the same, uh, the same movement? Um, and thirdly, I wonder more generally what the implications are for the integration of Hong Kong into, into China and the one nation, two systems um, uh, uh, attempt to solve this, pro this problem. Is this something that's, that's introducing a major instability into, the China, in, in, into, into Chinese cap capitalism? And what are the prospects for the kind of political radicalization that we've seen in Hong Kong beginning to connect with the movements <coughs> that we've seen in mainland, in mainland China? Thanks, Pab. Right, I'll try to be um, It's obviously we need another day school because there's so many questions just come out of that day school, so we need another day school so that we can start looking at the other things. I mean, things like the environment. There have been protests about the environment, I'll be back in a minute, um, within certain, certain areas. I think there was, there was a, a massive demonstration, well, a massive protest against an incinerator that was being built, they, they actually didn't build the incinerator after all. Now, coming from Leeds, where I could see three things from the home now, the university, the prison, and the incinerator, you know, I kind of think, well, they've got it right there. And it's contradictory. I mean, you know, when you, if, you, if you get a chance to travel to Zhejiang province, you know, what you do is you, you travel through hours, and I mean hours, of, of, of wind farms. You know, the toys complain about having the odd wind farm, you know, somewhere in York, North York Moors. But actually there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and there's also hundreds and hundreds of the old, um, you know, the thing, I don't know what they call them, gets it brings oil up. You know, <laughs> Um, there's hundreds of them. So the reason that the China is so keen to hang on to the Zhejiang province is because of the resources there, and also just in terms of simple things like solar powers. On you know, it just I see lots of house building going on at the moment in Britain, but I don't see many solar power that power panels on. And in certain areas, you know, you do see a massive number of solar powers. But then there's a contradiction. Somebody mentioned earlier on about the car. We went, when we went out, the, the first time we were out, the, the bicycle was king. Everybody cycled everywhere, you know. There was big cycle lanes and little car lanes. And now, of course, there's big car lanes and little cycle lanes. And actually, cycling becomes dangerous, so you don't do it. At the same time, a massive expansion of the number of things like most, most cities now have some sort of subway system. I mean, 11, 12 years ago, Shanghai had two lines, two. Now I think we're up to 16 or 17, but they're running out of colours, you know, in order to, to, to do it. So it is massively contradictory, you know, and again, there, are, there is lots more to discuss in terms, in terms of environment I haven't got time for. Um, the, 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 uh, there is, uh, just, just briefly about education, you see, one of the issues, the national government has said, every, you know, it's a bit like every child matters or no child gets left behind or whatever stuff they come out with all the time over here. But they have said, you know, there will not be a restriction, all children should have education between the ages, you know, etc, etc. The trouble is, it's funded locally and therefore some cities, and I think it was the Camilla at the back said, you know, in some cities, cities like Chongqing, they've gone, we need a skilled workforce. Mm -hmm. Let's tell you what, let's open up the schools and make sure they can do the exams. Good idea. Other cities are going, we haven't got the money, you are, you know, etc. Et so so there's, it's not, what I'm trying to say is it's not homogeneous. Mm -hmm. The attacks on the, um, on the, on the, on the schools in, up in the north west, you know, north east, have been closed for um, reasons against extremism, etc. You know, you, you, can, you can hear the jargon, you know, the stuff that's being, being said, etc. We don't want any Muslim schools, it's, you know, we get the same sort of nonsense over here. And finally, I think Alex says, I was, well, I was looking, scribbling around looking for, I think we've got to be clear here about our, oh, sorry, there was a thing about actually about students and workers. And things. You see, how did they get the umbrellas? Let's be honest, how did those students get the umbrellas? They didn't nip out while they were being attacked from CS gas, or better go buy an umbrella, had we? You know, what have we got on our shopping list? Umbrellas. Actually, they were getting it from workers and people walking, they were throwing down the umbrellas. So, I mean, if you know, people look at the beginning of the Occupy, uh, Occupy, the shops were cleared of stuff, the people were buying stuff to support the students. And I'm, I'm convinced that one of the reasons we didn't see the massacre 
in the same way they were worried about the consequences. You know, when I wrote, when we wrote that uh, that open letter that Christine Blower, it was when the teachers were announcing they were going to go on strike. I said, yes, you know. But, but it was, so what I'm saying, there wasn't the organisation, the organised workers there, but they must have had support from the workers, otherwise they couldn't have stayed on the streets for so long, you know. And actually those, those youngsters on the streets, a lot of them were, were you know, were, were daughters and sons of workers. But, you know, you, but there were people there, and, you know, if you hear Anne talk about, about Egypt, etc., and about when, you know, and I'm not saying we're there in China yet, don't, you know, don't quote, but, you know, again, up until you know the big you know the big night of the fight you know teachers were there as individuals it's only when they when the state starts to attack the the occupied to here that the, the people that start going to organize as, as, as groups of trade unions and workers so I, I think we've got to be careful and again i think with chairman Square, we've got to be careful you know history keeps getting rewritten doesn't it it keeps getting rewritten in order to justify what they did you know there are there are st story of workers yes some of the students said, go back to work, don't cause any trouble, you know. But, but this, this is what happens. We can't just say, right, this is the way the struggle will go. 1968, in, you know, in France, the students did this, and then the workers did that. And they, it doesn't work like that. It is, it, is, it is very, very fluid. But the final thing to say is our own ruling class. Not only is Prince Andrew going off to, to take off to go to China, etc., but let's be absolutely clear. The gas canisters that were used were made in Britain. It said so on the label. You know, probably one of the few things that left made in Britain now, you know. And when you know when you get the truth, not condemning that, and when you get the firm that makes the, 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 the CS gas going, we didn't know if we used against demonstrators. I don't think there are that many badges in Hong Kong myself, but I might be wrong, you know. And you know, please take me up on it. And actually, and Alex talked about I don't know why Alex talked, Alex must have said something because about really good. But I've just got a list just in case you want to go, of the delegates that went on Cameron's plane, right, where their names and where they work, like, uh, last year to try and earn some extra money. Our ruling class are in, are in league with their ruling class. They're mm. absolutely clear about that. Then. And therefore, the argument we have to have on the ground, of course, is what we can do here to help their struggle, helps our struggle, and maybe we might get a teacher strike sometime in the next millennium, you never know your luck. You know, people say, well, the Chinese work is hard. To be honest, we could do with it one or two days on, sorry, days on the picket line at, at this end. You know, this is, this is what we have to do. I think it's right. I mean, Lauren, oh, it's wrong. I keep saying that. Vincent and I said, if there was any questions we couldn't answer, we would send you all to Marxism. Yeah. So therefore, I'm going to send you all to Marxism and the <laughs>